Welcome back to the Pelvic Health Summit. I'm here with Dr. Yaniv Larish, who is a urologist and surgeon specializing in pelvic pain and bladder dysfunction in both men and women. His practice is the Fifth Avenue Urology, where he treats his patients. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for putting this uh, summit together. I think this is incredibly important. And uh, for all the men and women out there who are suffering from pelvic pain and have been pushed away, sent astray, and have been misdiagnosed and undertreated for God knows how long, I'm, I'm just so happy we have a forum to discuss everything. Definitely. Thank you so much for being here. Can you tell us a little bit more about your practice and approach? Certainly. So um, we at Fifth Avenue Urology are a three-person group, and we see men and women uh, for all sorts of urological issues. But my passion it really focuses on pelvic pain uh, in both men and women. Uh, there are plenty of practitioners in the city who are fantastic, most of which are on the panel today, who take care of women. And there's no question that women have now uh, really been um, identified as suffering from pelvic pain. Unfortunately, men have kind of gotten pushed to the wayside and we've kind of forgotten about them a little bit. And it's a very, very common condition in men. Uh, with some slight differences from women, but you know that's just uh, men and women, they're a little different. Uh, but the pain is the same. Um, and we often see, in addition to the pelvic pain, we see other manifestations of similar misfiring of neurons within the pelvis. We see a lot of erectile dysfunction. We see a lot of overactive bladder, painful urination. And so it, it's a constellation of symptoms rather than a single uh, diagnosis that I think is the, what drives our philosophy in trying to treat these patients. We have to view them holistically as uh, more than just one diagnosis. When I hear about patients who have interstitial cystitis, um, that usually misses the true diagnosis because people are just trying to find a, a rubric or, or a, a, a particular pigeonhole to put a diagnosis into when there's much more to it than that. Uh, when we talk to these patients who've been diagnosed with interstitial cystitis or pelvic pain, or in men most commonly, and it drives me crazy, prostatitis or chronic prostatitis, which by the way has nothing to do with the prostate, it's nothing to do with being chronic, it can be acute, and has nothing to do with infection and inflammation. So I don't know what kind of diagnosis that is chronic prostatitis, but it's not, it, it doesn't uh, embody the true disease. So. When we see patients, our philosophy is first to view them holistically. It's to not take any diagnosis for granted that they come in with. So we start from scratch. My wife likes to tell me that I have trust issues. <laughs> I just don't trust any diagnosis. Uh, and we like to start from square one because by the time the patients are getting into the office with me, they've been misdiagnosed for 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of work to do by the time they get to us. Awesome. Can you please walk us through some of the archetypes of the symptoms and the kinds of people who are coming in as patients sure. in your practice? Again, you know, there are many different people who come into the practice. Uh, men and women both. The women have as something as, as simple as an overactive bladder with spasm that is being misdiagnosed as chronic pelvic pain and that needs to be dealt with, to women who have endometriosis and an organic cause or an entrapped nerve or a femoral hernia. I mean, you've heard it from the rest of the panel today. Uh, in men, uh, the typical man who comes in says, you know, I have testicular pain or pain right below my belly button or above my pubic bone. I have pain in my groin. I think I have a hernia. We examine them from head to toe. We do a full and complete evaluation. We find nothing. And they've, they've been told that they have nothing and it's all in their head, or that they have blue balls. That's one of the things that, that the patients actually tell me that they've come in with. And when I hear that, I say, okay, well, what, what, if, what has been done for you? And they say, well, I've gotten uh, a, a six-week course of antibiotics, uh, even though my cultures were negative throughout. I had a rectal massage and a prostate massage, and I'm still where I am, and nothing has changed. And so that patient is my typical patient. It's somebody who's been through um, multiple practitioners and they've missed the boat on their diagnosis. The typical guy who comes in 
has a very specific personality type. Uh, it's a high functioning, successful guy. Why is that? Because those uh, men have a personality type that is very specific. They are type A personalities, overachievers, data driven. They think they know better than anybody else. And that's what makes them so successful in their business lives or in their professional lives where they know that they have the right answer. The problem is when it comes to the urinary, urinary life and to their sexual life and to their pain, that same mentality throws them for a loop. Um, they see that they have one poor erection while they have erectile, where they have uh, pelvic pain and in the setting of one single bad erection with some pelvic pain, they think that their penis is no longer functional and Truly, from a psychological point of view, it isn't. And we have to rehabilitate them. So we do a lot of work with that. Uh, we have men who uh, have been told that they have prostatitis. They've done the entire uh, gamut of, of uh, prostate massage, antibiotics, stretching, yoga, a million different things. Nothing seems to help. It turns out that when we target the true source of what is causing them to have the pelvic pain, which, full disclosure, I don't think anybody truly knows. But when we try to target misfiring nerves in the pelvis by downregulating the central nervous system, by attacking the inflammatory response, by removing any sort of noxious stimuli, um, the pain stimulus, we get really, really good results. Mm. Uh, we can't guarantee a cure, but we can certainly make people feel a whole lot better. Would you mind unpacking those three um, things, you know, that you go through, the um, misfiring of the nerves sure. and those things? Yeah, sure. So, uh, again, nobody really knows what the source of chronic pelvic pain is. Uh, and I use the word chronic in quotation marks because we don't really know if it's chronic or acute, and it can be both. Um, so we don't know what the source is, but we do know that the central nervous system plays a big role. Uh, and so, you know, pain. If you think about pain, pain is actually a very protective mechanism. It's the reason when you touch a hot stove with your hand, you don't end up barbecuing your hand. You move your hand away. It's because it hurts. So you have a stimulus, which is the hot stove, and you have your response, which is pain. And as a result of that pain, you move your hand and you've saved your arm. In pelvic pain, for whatever reason, there's an absence of, an, of a stimulus and yet the firing of the pain fibers are happening. So we don't know why that is. Uh, there's certainly some very good science being done by large academic institutions, but nobody really has pinned it down. We do know that there are several factors that contribute. So if somebody has an organic etiology, in other words, if somebody has a hernia, and maybe that hernia is causing those symptoms uh, or, or the the hernia is causing the stimulus for pain. We know that addressing that stimulus is very important. So our first order of business is to rule out any sort of true stimuli. Mm -hmm. So that means we check them for growing hernias, we check them for sports hernias, we check them for infections, et cetera. The second phase, once we've ruled out any sort of organic etiology, is to downregulate the, the central nervous system. And uh, I'm sure you've heard it from the rest of the panel today how much everybody stresses it. Uh, I'm not going to say that uh, I have any different, anything different to say. I agree 100%. I think we need to downregulate the pelvis. I happen to do it with uh, amitriptyline. seems to be my drug of choice. Um, but there are, are many, many different drugs out there. All of them work pretty well. Uh, amitriptyline seems to be the one that the American Urological Association endorses for pelvic pain. So that's what I use. Um, so we address the central nervous system, we've addressed the organic etiology, and then we address inflammation. So I almost always will put patients on a short course of anti-inflammatories, non-narcotic, non-habit-forming, non-constipating. We don't want any of that. We want to just address the inflammation, usually with a very potent anti-inflammatory. So between the addressing the organic etiology, down-regulating the central nervous system, and decreasing inflammation, that generally resets the button. And if we can hit the reset, hit, do a control-alt-delete mm -hmm. to the pelvis, 
we've done a world of good and most men and certainly most women have tremendous relief from that. Fabulous. And can you talk a little bit more about, you know, when those, um, you know, initial um, course of action doesn't work, what are some of the surgeries that um, you perform and what conditions are they um, associated with? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. So in women, uh, certainly if there's endometriosis, I, I happen to work with a lot of people on the panel who are uh, key opinion leaders in endometriosis uh, today. Um, Dr. Orbach, uh, Dr. Pointer, Dr. Sechkin, all fantastic surgeons. I do all of the urological component uh, of those surgeries. Why do you need a urologist in a surgery like that? Because oftentimes endometriosis doesn't know what a gynecological organ is and what a urinary organ is, and it affects everything. So we find endometriosis on the ureters, which are those tubes that drain the kidneys down to the bladder. We find it on the bladder itself. And so oftentimes I'm called in to reconstruct or, or at the very least to help identify those urinary structures and keep them out of harm's way. Uh, in men, uh, the pelvic pain syndrome in men oftentimes is combined with erectile dysfunction and with overactive bladder, frequent urination, urgent urination, painful urination. So once we've tried conservative measures in terms of anti-inflammatories, down-regulating the central nervous system, and addressing organic etiologies, which is not a drug, but it's our other mainstay of therapy, we then start getting into the more specific uh, surgical interventions that I can do to help people with overactive bladder, uh, which is part of the uh, pelvic pain syndrome, or erectile dysfunction that doesn't respond to just talk therapy. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll speak about both. For erectile dysfunction, we have a complete um, uh, stepwise progression of multiple multiple steps, multiple tools that we can use to try to get a really, really good erection. A really good erection being uh, an erection that is strong enough for penetration and that satisfies both the man and his partner. Uh, that includes oral medications. Those are the uh, drugs you see commercials for on television, the Viagra, Cialis, Levitra of the world. Uh, there are urethral uh, pellets, so for some men, the Viagra, Cialis, and Levitras of the world give them headaches or muscle aches, and that's because they're swallowing a pill and it's being dispersed throughout their entire body. So somebody came up with a fantastic solution to actually put a small pill into the penis. Sounds a little scary, works fantastic. Uh, it's just a direct drug delivery into the penis itself. Uh, for those men who can't tolerate that medication for many reasons, we have injection therapy. Uh, there are drugs out there called uh, erectogenic medications were actually injected uh, with a tiny diabetic needle into the side of the penis. It sounds scarier than it is, uh, but it's not painful at all. Uh, it's painful psychologically. It's not painful physiologically. So once uh, the patient and I do it together in the office, I show them how to do it. We prove to them that they can get a 10 out of 10 erection like when they were 18 again. That right there solves 30% of their psychological barriers in terms of dealing with pain because they have a ray of hope. And that's, that's really the key here, is to provide a ray of hope so that somebody can really, after down-regulating, hitting, hitting the reset button, build up from scratch back to a normal life, getting your life back. Um, if the injections don't work, we have other uh, options for men, um, and those are surgical options. So we do uh, a penile prosthetic. A penile prosthetic is an implantable uh, implant that goes into the penis and it's controlled with a small pump in the scrotum. Um, the goals of the therapy, of the surgery, are to give you the biggest, hardest erection we can give you and give you the most natural look so that nobody knows that you have the implant except for yourself. Not yourself, obviously, but the guys out there. So um, when, when we do that surgery, uh, when we look at the statistics of satisfaction from that surgery, there's a 95% satisfaction between, of, of the man's partner after the implant, 95%. So, you know, that's about as good as it gets. Um, the implants come in many, many different uh, models. 
different sizes, different strengths, uh, and we work through all that as part of what we talk about in the office, if need be. Mm -hmm. It's very important to understand that is the last and final kind of step that we take. That's not our go-to. Uh, so we, we have to work up to that if, and we have to build trust though, between uh, the patient and myself in order to get to that point. Um, the other thing that we do for uh, the overactive bladder, frequent urination, urgency of urination, incontinence of urine, and uh, pain with urination is something called the sacral neuromodulator. Sacral neuromodulator has been around for a long time. Uh, it's uh, made by a company called Medtronic, and it's basically a pacemaker for the bladder. It's in fact the same manufacturer for pacemakers for the heart. They make a pacemaker for the bladder. Um, it's a very, very simple procedure. It takes maybe 15 minutes. It's done with some local anesthetic. We place a tiny little uh, metal wire under the skin on the tush, and we connect it to a little battery pack. And if you have relief after the first three days, we know that it's working, and then we can put in the real uh, the pacemaker for you. The real pacemaker, part two, is a 25-minute procedure. People go home same day, they go back to work the same day. It's a, as minor of a procedure as you can get. Again, that uh, implant seems to give people so much relief from the urgency, frequency, painful urination, urgent, uh, urgent continence, mm -hmm. uh, dribbling after urination. These are all things that we see uh, as part of the chronic pelvic pain syndrome. Can you please tell us what a urologist's involvement with endometriosis looks like? Sure, that's a great question. So it's not uncommon for women with endometriosis to present with their initial complaint being urgency, frequency, painful urination, and a diagnosis from other doctors of interstitial cystitis. So generally, when I hear that constellation of symptoms that is tied to a cyclical monthly period, the diagnosis clinically is made there. The rest is laparoscopic, and I refer them to some of the great members on your panel today, Dr. Orbach, Dr. Pointer, Dr. Sechkin, all, all leaders in the field of endometriosis. My involvement starts with early diagnosis and referral to experts in surgery. My involvement surgically with the same doctors is to separate the urinary organs from the gynecological organs. So uh, it's not uncommon for endometriosis to uh, implant itself on the urinary organs, on the ureters, those two tubes that lead from the kidney down to the bladder, uh, on the bladder itself, uh, and deep within the pelvis. That's my area of expertise is treating surgically those organs. So we oftentimes are called in, especially in cases where we know that those organ, the urinary organs are at risk, to come in and give our expert opinion and, and provide surgical expertise in separating those ureters and bladder from the endometriosis. Oddly enough, about a year ago, uh, we came up with a brand new uh, method of identifying the ureters surgically. So we do the same surgery that we always do, we've always done, which is highlighting where the ureters are, surgically pointing them out. But now we inject a very uh, new chemical called ICG, which is totally safe, uh, not metabolized by the kidney, doesn't really have any sort of deleterious effect. Turns out when you put ICG into the urinary system and you shine a light just so on it, it starts glowing bright green like Slimer from Ghostbusters. <laughs> There's nothing in the body that has that color. So it's very, very easy then to say, look, this is your landing, these are your uh, landing strips, this is what you have to stay away from, and separating the urinary structures from the gynecological structures. Wow, thank you, super informative. Yeah. So tell us more about, um, for people who are not located in New York City, what are some resources that they can find online? How can they find out if their local urologist has the depth of knowledge that you have that's for a public great, health. It's a great question. You know, the problem that many, many men find, especially men who have come to see me from out of state or even out of the country, is that their local urologist is not tuned in, they're not keyed in to pelvic pain. Unfortunately, most surgically minded doctors uh, have really one goal in mind, which is to get you in and out of the office as quickly as possible. 
that just does not work with pelvic pain. Doesn't work. So uh, we don't operate that way. We kind of treat each patient uh, on an individual basis. My consultations are sometimes an hour long. Obviously, that's not easy to replicate everywhere, and there are good reasons for that. But I would say that if you are unable to come to New York and see a true expert in the field, and you want to know if your local urologist has the capability and capacity and time to deal with you, you have to ask very upfront, do you treat chronic pelvic pain syndrome? Have you treated it before? What is your breadth and depth of knowledge? Do you have time for me? I understand that my consultation for pain is gonna take longer than a regular visit. Will you have time for me? And if the answer is no, that's not the right person. Mm -hmm. If the answer is yes, give it a shot. Awesome, thank you so much. Can you tell us how we can find more information about you Absolutely. and your practice? Absolutely, so our practice is located on 76th Street between 5th and Madison Avenue in Manhattan, right off Central Park. Um, we can uh, find us on the web at www.5thavenueurology.com, all spelled out, 5thavenueurology.com. Uh, or on our, you can always give us a call in the office, 212-370-4170. Um, and uh, we generally give out our cell phone to patients so that we have constant and uh, constant communication with our patients uh, via cell phone. Awesome. Thank you so much. I will link all of that information in the group so you can do your own research and reach out. And thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Now I'd like to hear from you. Please share with us one takeaway from the interview in the comments below. Give us a like and share this group with someone who you think will benefit. Thank you.